Hello, and welcome to Book Circle Presents The Cavalry Cycle by Earl Weinberg. Tonight, we begin our reading of Tamer of Horses. It had been a rough passage. The sails of the GNNV Bethos had, of course, been furled, but the rigging of the fore topsail had been snarled somehow by wind or sheer chaos, so it could not now be unfurled. Ensign Inez Tauvin was proud to be the one to go up the mast and unsnarl it. She could show off her rigging skills and perhaps be the first to sight land. There was no land to be seen, though, only open water, almost calm, as it must have been before the water spout descended, depositing the bethos. Above, the sky was clear except for a spattering of small clouds. If you knew, you could see the remains of the spiral formation where the water spout must have blossomed. The sun was at late afternoon. It looked like a normal sun, but the position meant, well, it could mean too many things. Maybe they were in a different time zone now. Maybe it was an early morning sun. Maybe there had been a time slip. Maybe it just looked like the regular sun. Maybe they had spent more time than Inez realized recovering from the passage through chaos. To work. She got much of the snarl undone, but eventually she came to a point where one loop had gone through another, how in hell could mere wind have done that, and the outer loop pulled tight. A good, good hard pull would do it, but not from her. She looked down at the deck. She had an audience looking up. Send up someone big, she called. I need a hard pull. Someone yelled back, aye, and she turned back to the mess of rope. Time passed. She was peripherally aware of jolts and tuggings on the shrouds as someone big started up. A little later, and not so peripherally, she became aware that the shroud lines were taut and rigid. She looked down. She should have been more specific. By someone big, she had meant, for instance, Rollo, who was over 200 pounds. What she was getting was one of the centaurs. He was a huge black mass that at the moment seemed to have far more legs than the standard four, plus the torso of an outsized blacksmith clad in a red-brown cavalry t-shirt. He rose higher, tug by tug. She deliberately banished an image of the whole ship tipping over as this object unbalanced it. He was staring straight at the mast, looking neither up nor down, and his face, the part not covered by curly black beard, looked putty-colored, not at all like the ruddy tan of his arms. As he got closer, she heard him muttering something. It sounded like big as a dime, over and over. She glanced down at her own feet, bare and slightly but usefully prehensile. She looked at the flailing hooves coming up on the rat lines. How? She could hear him more clearly now. Pegasus time. Pegasus time. Was it a spell? She hoped so. He was about a fathom below her. Reluctantly, he looked up, squinting as if she were as bright as the sun. Throw me the rope. The deep voice trembled. Line, she corrected. Just throw it. She watched him work at releasing one hand and holding it out to her. He very much did not want to let go of the rat line. Rollo would have just climbed up and taken the line from her. This creature ought to do the same, but she decided not to push it. She tossed. The loosely coiled line went over his arm like a horseshoe over a peg. Thank you, he said, and began plucking a foreleg out of the webbing. How can you climb? she asked. I wonder, he muttered, once more staring straight at the mast. But then he held the foreleg out and up for her inspection. Cleated boots. Sure enough, the hoof was not bare, but in a neatly buckled boot, with a cleated sole, perhaps of hard rubber. What do I do now? he asked. Just climb down with the line. It'll go taut, but keep on going. I need your weight to pull it out of that loop. She pointed, and he glanced briefly after her gesture, then back to the mast. 
He nodded and started working his way down. He seemed to be getting better at it with practice and faster. He was clearly anxious to get down. Yes, she had asked for someone big, but why one of them? Down on the deck, Rachel Coudre, captain of the Bethos, was asking the same question of Philip Fletcher, captain of the Offham trainee class of the dedicated cavalry. What was that stunt all about? Hasn't my ship taken enough of a beating without dropping centaurs on it? Fletcher smiled. He didn't drop and he won't. He's Mr. Wardley, he called. Rene Wardley, Rennie to his friends and also known as Horsepower, was now near the bottom of the shrouds close to the ship's railing. A great grin of relief spread through his beard and he looked disposed to hop down the last four feet. Just swing around underneath and let yourself down gently, Fletcher called to him. My deck, Captain Coudray muttered just half a second too late as Wardley nodded, saluted with his free hand, then swung his whole mass around and under the shrouds down onto the deck, rear legs, then forelegs. He did this with a facility that made it clear it was the height of the mast that had given him trouble, not the act of climbing. Somewhere in the last several yards, he had pulled the line free, but he did not appear to have noticed. I admit to the label stunt, Fletcher said, as Wardley frisked back over him, over to him, merry with relief. But a stunt is for an audience. I wanted people to see what Wardley can do. In particular, Wardley, I wanted you to see what you can do. Wardley sobered and saluted. And other people, of course. There are some. He swept his gaze blandly over the folk on deck, many of them still watching the denouement of the stunt, who regard us as pointlessly talkative pack animals, or a freakish alternative to the standard cavalry. And she did ask for someone big. Lucky we were already wearing our deck boots, eh? He grinned down at her. Coudre sighed. How big are you, lad? She asked Wardley, now looming over her like a respectful thunderhead. Eight feet tall, ma'am, he answered promptly, saluting. He must get asked his dimensions a lot. And an even ton. Imperial or metric? Just imperial, ma'am. Undoubtedly the biggest person on the ship, and the least likely to shinny up the rigging, but his captain had set him to it. The dedicated cavalry was over 70 years old, but Fletcher, it seemed, thought it still needed to be sold, and he was probably right. However, you don't think it was rather dangerous, she asked Fletcher. Fletcher also loomed, but was a mere seven feet tall, a white-haired, white-bearded, done in cowboy hat and t-shirt. Oh no, Fletcher answered airily, he's had practice. What did that rope ladder remind you of, Wardley? The climbing net on the agility course, sir, he answered. Coudray guessed it was not his favorite piece of equipment. It's exactly like, made to the same spec. We looked it up, or rather, Mr. Darnley looked it up for me. He nodded toward another trainee, a dark bay, who smiled, saluted, and brandished a phone in evidence. You have them practice climbing nets, Coudray asked. It was the sort of thing you wanted to get clear. No, ma'am, Wardley volunteered. He leads us in climbing nets. His eyes gleamed with pride in his teacher, but then darkened with reproach. Only not so high, and with safety harness. Have to take the safety harness off sometime, lad, Fletcher told him. Anyway, you've already dropped out of the sky today. What's a little mast? Coudray sighed again and looked up at the sky, where the clouds were nearly done dispersing out of the spiral pattern, sauntering off innocently as if they had not just attended a rupture of chaos into wherever they were now. Anything else we can do to help with repairs? Fletcher asked her. Thank you, lad, Coudray said to Wardley with a dismissive nod. She did not want to discuss exactly how screwed their equipment was in front of a trainee. Wardley saluted again and did his best to withdraw. Even crowded in among his classmates, he was conspicuous, but it was all he could do. A rangy young chestnut grinned at him and gave him a high five. You look awesome up there, big buddy, he told him. It was his good friend Danny Bryce, often called Trickshot. I looked like a circus act. Coudray call it a stunt. An awesome stunt. Horsepower's always awesome, declared Carlin, a white and brown paint. He gave Wardley a friendly clap on the withers. It was he who had given Wardley the nickname Horsepower. 
Thanks. Any idea where we are yet? You didn't see any land up there? Asked Danny. I just looked at the mast all the time so I wouldn't scream like a little girl, Wardley rumbled, but I'm sure that ensign would have sung out if she'd seen anything. He looked at Charles Darnley, a.k.a. Charlie Horse, the one who had looked up the specs of the rope ladder. He was the class intellectual and general answer man. Charlie shook his head. At the moment, our best bet is to ask Luanen when she comes around. Luanen was the ship's nix. But right now, she's just lying in sickbay, panting. I haven't heard if she's unconscious or not. She's certainly not responding. A couple of the Mer crew are sluicing seawater over her. I'm told that ought to be soothing. This was not at all the way the voyage was supposed to go. A few hours ago, the Grand Norman naval vessel Bethos had set out from Cote d'Is, main port of Brickell, a small worldlet held by Grand Normandy. It was bound on a voyage of exploration. It had nosed cautiously into the edge storm that bordered Brickell, expecting a very rough ride through watery chaos, then to emerge from another edge storm in a somewhat well-known worldlet somewhere in the Hathor marshes. That was the plan. But they were, after all, sailing chaos. The ride had gotten much worse even than expected. The bottom had dropped out of the sea, then the Nix had shrieked and enveloped the entire ship in stinging blue light. That was tied somehow to why the ship had not simply been torn apart by the water spout as it rode it down to the sea, where it impacted. Well, no one knew how hard it had hit, but the Nix's magic undoubtedly saw them through that too. No one was surprised that Luanen had fainted. They were a bit surprised she had not turned into a gull and jumped ship. And they were very, very grateful. We may learn more when the stars come out, Charlie Horse added, glancing at the sun. Yes, it was a regular yellow sun and definitely setting. And gravity and air mix were normal. All good signs as far as they went. Danny turned to another classmate, Palomino Paul Fells, and asked, how are the horses? Still asleep. On the deck below, two dozen horses, pack animals, and standard cavalry mounts hung in special transport slings in enchanted sleep. Several centaurs had expressed envy. They had been stuck in similar slings, but awake all through the passage. They'll be fine as long as we can get them to water and pasture soon enough. These would have been ready to hand if they had come out in the Hathor Reach as planned. There was a splashing sound in the water below. Fells glanced over, then beckoned Danny to the rail. Thus, they were both in position to offer a hand to the young woman who came over the rail. Thanks, she said to Fells and to Danny. Hey, dance partner. Hi, Mrs. Novino, Danny replied. I mean, Lieutenant. Jenny is fine right now, she said, holding on to their hands and heaving herself up to sit on the rail. She was, starting at the top, an athletic young woman in sh with short brown hair and a sober blue swim top. Below that, she wore a utility belt, and below that were the gills and five feet of fishtail with golden brown scales and brown fins. How's it look below? Fells asked. Better than it did, the mermaid answered carefully. I came up for another tub of sealant. At least it's easy to apply with the water rush uh, going with the flow. We aren't sinking, are we? Fells asked. No, no, but we ha do have to keep the bailing pumps going right now. I expect you'll be called down to take your turn soon, unless they can get the power back on. From the way Crotal is swearing, it might not be long. Crotal was the chief gremlin, partner to the ship engineer. Then she smiled. The really good news is that it's shallow bottom. Danny and Fells nodded cautiously. She read the landsman's incomprehension. That means, she said, that we're probably not far from shore. That got her genuine smiles. Any way to guess which way? asked Fells, glancing at the featureless horizon. Given the time and the wind, she answered promptly, that way most likely. She turned and pointed behind her along the wind. Kudre will want us to scout that way, I expect. And why would I want to do that, Lieutenant? Kudre came round Fells' hindquarters just in time to hear Jenny's prediction. Jenny smiled. Shallow bottom, ma'am, and this might be a land breeze, so best chance for land is that way. Kudre nodded. Best news I've heard since we're best news I've had since I heard we're in one piece and the bailing pumps are working. 
See to it, Lieutenant. Pick a partner and head out. Walkie-talkie report every 15 minutes. Aye, ma'am. Jenny smiled, saluted, and slid backward off the deck into the water. The captain looked at Fells, then Danny. Ready to take a few turns on those bailing pumps? Yes, ma'am, they chorused. The downside of having great endurance was having to use it. But after the Mer crew finished the first round of patching, the bailing pumps caught up. The sun was just down and a crescent moon hung in the west when Danny climbed back on deck. A few minutes later, Charlie Horse emerged. His young friend was staring at the moon. Why are they ringing that bell? He asked Charlie Horse. Is it some kind of warning? His tone was remote and he never took his eyes off the moon. No, no, Charlie Horse assured him. No warning. Things are looking up, didn't you hear? Jenny and her friend found a shore, not too far east. The bell is to help them find their way back to the ship. It did sound ominous, though. The Mer crew had hung a big brass bell under the ship. They were still ringing it at slow, stately intervals. It was audible on deck and reverberated everywhere below. Jenny and Adele, on their walkie-talkies, reported the sound steadily getting louder. They would be back soon. Danny nodded and repeated, looking up as if by rote. He still stared at the moon. Charlie Horse followed his gaze. What is it? Charlie Horse, this looked like a pretty regular zone, right? Yes, so far. Why? Why? How screwed are we if you can see stars through the moon? Uh, that would be a very different place. Do you? Danny nodded. Charlie Horse believed him. Danny, a.k.a. Trickshot, was the best archer in his class, maybe even magical, and certainly had the best vision. Charlie Horse searched between the horns of the moon, and now that he was looking for them, did see very tiny stars, two of them. Let me get some binoculars, he murmured. He wormed away through the obstacle course that was the deck, leaving Danny to his worries. What more likely than that a random fall through chaos would leave them in some uncharted, unknown zone? How were they to get back? You couldn't recall the water spout. If the very sky misbehaved like that, how off-kilter was this world? Danny had longed for his transformation. He had joined the dedicated cavalry at 16, the earliest allowed age. He had been happy to pay for the new shape with 14 years' service in the expeditionary forces. In fact, exploration was a bonus, an exciting icing on the cake. He knew, of course, that it was dangerous, but he had faced that. Thought he had faced it. Now he was not so sure. Danny was not a natural worrier. The fall out of the sky had been too abrupt to qualify for worry, and then it had been easy to not worry when you were busy helping A, make sure everyone was alive, B, make sure the horses were all right, C, assess damage, D, get on deck to stay out of the way, and finally E, work bailing pumps. But now, tired, alone for the moment, and in the dark, Danny started to wonder how lost he was. If the moon here was actually crescent-shaped, that was one freaky little world, far away from anything discovered by any Grand Norman expedition any expedition that had returned. He thought about his last email home. He couldn't remember it in detail, but it had been full of enthusiasm and cheer, with a picture of him freshly done with his equine growth spurt, a chestnut stallion and a rangy young man with a new red blaze of beard, fully loaded with trekking gear, holding the reins to Bisu and good old Nuck, likewise loaded. He'd expected to see that picture in the family album next Christmas. It would undoubtedly be there. Would he? Charlie Horse came looming and blundering out of the gloom with the binoculars. He trained them on the moon, but his hands were unsteady. Charlie Horse was second biggest after horsepower. It was easy to tell if he was trembling. He propped his elbows on the rail, hunkered down, and tried again. The binoculars and the deepening darkness made it clearer. There were little stars between the horns of the moon, at least half a dozen. Charlie Horse inhaled sharply, then handed the binoculars to Danny. Danny, what do you see? Describe it. Yep, they're there, he confirmed grimly. 
Give me details. What colors? They're all the same color, a little yellowish. Anything else? Do they flicker? No, they're steady. The biggest one is a little fuzzy, not quite round. Wait, are they planets? Are they something on the moon? Yes, they're cities. I know where we are now, broadly speaking. We're on Hob. Let's find the captains. And we'll find out more about where Hod is and why it's a good thing that they're there next time.